Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello and welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, your digital learning coach. Welcome to Digital Learning Today, the show that helps you learn how to use instructional technology to its finest in your classroom. My guest today is a master at project-based learning, and I'm so happy to bring on to the show today, Mr. Dan Thomas. Dan, how are you today? Welcome to Teacher Cast. Hey, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here, Jeff. I am so excited to have you on. There's been so many people that have said, you've got to have this guy on your show. Thank you for your time. Before we get into the meat of this, you are a Lego trainer. You are a STEM leader. You are a, a podcaster. Tell everybody, who is Dan Thomas? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a tech teacher in, in my old high school, actually. You know, I've been, I've been teaching for 32 years. Uh, had one job. Uh, my, my kind of my joke is they let me out for five years for good behavior. Uh, I, I, one job, love my job, get to play with Lego all the time and, and do projects. And it's, it's just a great place to be in my little, uh, little corner. Well, you just started a podcast recently. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a lover of golf. So I, I created a, a podcast that kind of blends tech ed in STEM education with, with golf. Cause I think that golf is a great metaphor for what we do in life and what we do in the classroom, because you know, you, you hit some great shots and you get a bad result. You hit some crappy shots and you get some awesome results and somewhere in between, and you just got to play the next shot. So what have you learned after doing so, uh, you know, a few episodes so far? Uh, it's harder than it looks. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's more than just, you know, opening up the mic and sitting there and talking, which, I'm good at, but it's, it's been a wonderful thing. And it's, and it's, um, it's getting some traction now. Thanks. Thanks to people like you, Jeff. And you are a member of uh, a certain podcasting network. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you've been doing with other podcasters in your niche. Oh, I'm so excited to be part of the X Factor broadcast or uh, podcasting network with, with Dr. Matt Joseph, a wonderful guy who actually I met during COVID. Uh, he's, he's a Massachusetts guy. And um, I met him because he hosted a weekly show, little Zoom call during COVID time. And, and I got to meet him and uh, do, do a lot of great stuff. And he said, hey, we're going to start this podcast network. Would you be interested? And I'm like, sure. I've been trying to launch something and this is going to get me to go. And ju uh, Matt's just a great guy. Uh, he wants to help everybody out and, and get, a, get everybody going forward. And it's just been a wonderful experience in him and Lori Guion. And there's a bunch of new podcasts on the network. So check it out over at X Factor EDU. And uh, there's some really good stuff going on. And where can people learn more about your podcast? Uh, my podcast, you can go to my website at coachthomastech.com. And there's a link to my podcast on there. I, I upload the feeds. I'm trying to trying to get on a regular schedule. I've uh, been a little bit busy. I'm trying to do like uh, every couple every couple of weeks on a Monday, get them out. Uh, but, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. We're going to make sure that we have all of the links to Thomas's show and all of the other X Factor shows, of course, on our show notes here. Head on over to teachercast.net for more information. Dan, I'm so glad that you're here today because I wanted to talk a little bit about project-based learning. You know, we've been talking about PBL now for over 13 years, but that name and that title and that concept has certainly changed a lot, right? Um, projects have evolved. Technology has morphed. Teachers have gotten wiser, but at the same time, there's a lot of new teachers coming in, trying to do projects, trying to build a classroom that's built off of play. How do you define the term project-based learning? What does it look like? What should it look like? Well, in my classroom, that's all I do is projects. I've been doing project-based learning since day one in February of 93 when I started teaching. I started in the shop. And project-based learning is more than just, hey, we're going to do a project. There has to be a, a, a real-world tie to it, and there has to be an authentic audience to it. So you have to get it outside the classroom walls. 
You have to get it outside of your classroom. And it's got to be something that the, the kids are interested in. They take the ownership of the learning. And I think that's really the bottom line, in my opinion, of what project-based learning is, is where the kids are going to kind of discover some things where you're not necessarily up there leading and teaching and in in just giving knowledge where the kids are you're guiding them to the to the answers and the solutions that might be totally something you might not be thinking of as a teacher that you want to get so uh, i'm looking at it as a, as a way to to kids problem solve and learn some of those soft skills that we're that we're losing uh to be honest with you but creating an environment where students are taking advantage of, you know, projects, their own learning, this isn't easy, you know, and I say that from somebody who's been teaching in the classroom for 25 years now, almost, you know, you have to have a certain environment, you have to have that certain relationship with your students. How do you start to build a relationship with your classroom? So that way, project based learning is possible. Oh, great question. Um, it's all about connections. You know, you, you hear this all the time. Uh, and Matt Joseph is big on, on making the connections with the kids. But you have to know your kids. Uh, it, there's the saying that says, you know, the, the kids aren't going to care how much you know unless they know how much you care. So you, And that's one of the benefits of project-based learning is you can have those conversations with the kids while they're building something, while they're doing something. Um, I, Jeff, as you, as you alluded to earlier, I pull out Lego all the time. Mm. Lego is on my tables everywhere. In fact, uh, most days of the week when the kids show up in the classroom, we're building something with Lego. We're going to take, as, you know, you, a lot of teachers do a bell ringer where it might be a worksheet or answer a couple questions. Our bell ringer is we build something with Lego. And and when we do that, we I get to see their thought process. I get to walk around and make connections with them. I ask them about their their baseball games or their choir concert or whatever it else is they're doing. But I ask, I take you got to take a genuine interest in the kids, and you got to make that connection, so that then you can steer your classroom to that to to what the kid wants. Um, and, and it's easy to to go connect with that outgoing. Uh, extroverted kid that's going to, you know, be the first one to answer the questions. Um, but this allows project-based learning, Lego, uh, play in the classroom allows you to make that connection with with just about everybody that that's in the classroom. But what um, happens so if you fun. have what happens if you have students that just aren't there? I mean, I, I you know, for my, for instance, I teach five classes a day. Not every class is built the same. Not every class has the same makeup of students. What happens if you want to move in that direction? But for some reason, like two of the classes out of the five are able to move in a direction. The other ones just don't seem like they're they're going to get there. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of this too is you can you can modify it. It, it that's where that's where project based learning is awesome, and in the STEM classes like I teach is awesome because one we don't have a, a test at the end, so that's that's always a plus. Mm -hmm. But two the kids are designing the outcome. So period one, block one might be doing one thing, but block two might be doing something totally different with the same concept because they're choosing what it is that they're going to create uh, and to, to demonstrate the knowledge of, of the concept content of whatever it is we're doing. So some of that could be a multiple choice test a lot of you know so that could be built in there so there's still some you know traditional schooling built into these things but we're building something with their hands we're getting their hands dirty take us through those beginning stages right it's day one you're meeting the kids for the first time and you teach middle school so these kids are groomed to be having you know lecture style classes question and answer uh you know maybe teacher asks a bunch of questions and the students may or may not respond. And then you come in and, Hey, we're playing with Lego. What is that opening conversation look like? How long does it take for you to transform that class? And what advice do you have for anybody who's looking forward to their first day next September? Oh man, that's a tough one because even after 32 years, Jeff, that, that, that question is hard because by the time I get them in seventh grade, because uh, there's a whole dynamic in seventh grade on top of it. Middle school mm -hmm. kids are a unique blend of yes. everything. Hormones. Um, that's a great word. Um, 
but there's so much going on because especially seventh graders are trying to find out who they are. They're trying to find out who their friends are. They're worried about lots of other things more so than school. Um, and with that being said, the first exercise I do with my kids is a traditional Lego exercise where we build a duck. It's a classic thing. You get six bricks, you're building a, a little plastic Lego duck. And the, the key for this one is, and if you look at the Lego training stuff, it, it identifies 24 different skills that the kids learn in, in a 60, little 60 second exercise. You know, so they, they don't really care about that. The teachers do because, you know, you're doing long term memory, you're doing emotional, social, emotional regulation, uh, you're doing um, all kinds of good stuff. But what I do it for is if I have a class of 25 kids, I get 25 different ducks. And I want to show them that, hey, you all got the same materials, you all got the same time frame in the same place, and everybody came up with a different answer. And every answer was correct because every answer is you, because you could defend that, that that's a duck. And I need to get them to realize that, Hey, what I answer isn't necessarily, you know, I'm not going to do the same thing. Cause if, if I'm going to do that with the kids, I might as well just go to the grocery store down the baking aisle. And that's what I tell them, go buy that cake mix, throw the two eggs and the oil in it, throw it in the oven. And we have a cake. What did we learn? We learned how to follow instructions. We didn't learn content. And I think that's what a lot of tests. And I think that's where like, middle school is right now. So I, that's just a, a battle that I fight all the time. Um, but I try to get other teachers in the building to buy into it and, and work uh, and get out of my classroom. You said you teach seventh grade. Is that the only grade that you teach? Uh, I have a high school class as well, which is a mixture of ninth through 12. And how differently are you able to I don't know if the word is teach or convert, but how, what is the difference between working with seventh graders on this concept and nine, 10, 11, 12? You know, you'd think it'd be different, but if you really step back and take the big picture, look, even if they're 18 years old and they're coming into your classroom, they're still kids. They still want to be kids. They still want to have fun. They still want to play. Um, and I think a lot of, we put a lot of responsibility on them but they want to have some fun. So it's, it's really in my classes is, is again, project-based We're doing hands-on. Um, I'm all about doing some activity first, getting the kids dirty and messy figuratively and literally uh, with some stuff. So mm -hmm. it's amazing what happens because they, they time flies discipline. I, I have very little discipline problems in my, in my classroom as a one result. Of, one of the things that, that I often struggle with, is getting and keeping the supplies. It's easy to stick a duck in a pocket. How do you address that? How do you make sure that at the end of the day, you can have the same amount of materials for tomorrow? Or do you just go out and buy enough for a hundred ducks and whatever happens, happens? Yes, to both of those. Now in my classroom, I, I have a hundred pounds of Lego. Got bricks it. in my classroom that I bought over the years, just bulk Lego or, or donations. Um, but like the ducks, I'll, I'll, I'll leave them on the desk and I'll say, you know, put them back in the baggie. Uh, I have them actually in a little small little Ziploc baggie. Uh, cause I haven't found a better way to, I probably should get little storage containers to put them in. Cause I take them with me. They travel. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as supplies go, they're everywhere in my classroom. Uh, I, I, I use recycled materials. And by that, I mean, if you don't have it at home or I can't get it, we don't use it. I don't want you to go into Walmart or Target or Michaels or Hobby Lobby or whatever it is and buying that poster board that's going to end up in the garbage because that's where they all end up. Uh, so we use recycled stuff. And that, and then again, brings in the problem solving and the critical thinking skills that we need. That is some great advice. And, you know, I've had an opportunity over the last few weeks working with my middle schoolers to try to start some project based learning. It isn't easy. I found that sixth grade is a little bit easier to push. Um, even now, you know, sixth graders walk in as, as post fifth graders. They're, you know, they're fifth graders just a little bit taller. Um, my eighth graders at this point have kind of been checking out a little bit. But, uh, you know, to your point, my seventh graders are right there with me. And they're having a good time and they're still kids and they're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing together. 
I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your relationship with administration, right? Clearly, when you've got a project-based learning classroom like you do, it isn't the traditional, you know, check off observation. Do they have a this on the wall? Are they doing this to the, you know, observing you is different than observing an English class. Or am I wrong about that? Do you have a special relationship that says, look, when you walk into my room, chaos is going to be happening. Here's the philosophy. So that way, you know what to look for during those fun evaluation times. You know, it's all about having conversations too. I mean, our, I'm I'm blessed in the fact that I got awesome administration. I got a great principal who unfortunately is retiring at the end of this year. Uh, so that's going to be a big loss, but they're very supportive. I, I let them know what's going on and I invite them into my classroom all the time. I'll say, Hey, we're, we're like, we just finished up a mousetrap car project. So we were out in the hallway shooting mousetrap cars down the hallway. Um, we were loud. We were obnoxious. We were having fun. Kids were, cars were turning left, slamming into the wall. It was a good time. And they know that they know that's going on out there and they expect those things. They know my room's going to be a mess. They know they might walk into my room and not see me because I'm hanging out with some kids in the corner somewhere working on a project. I'm not going to be up in front of the class. I'm my, my class isn't going to be listed in cemetery rows. Um, so they're looking for questioning skills. They're looking for how I'm asking, talking to the kids, how I'm inter- and how the kids are engaged with the project. I mean, that's typical stuff in every classroom. They want to know how you question the kids. Um, to be honest, though, I don't write a lot of lesson plans. So if I do an observation, it's a special thing for me to write a lesson plan as a result. Well, I, I was going to ask you about curriculum writing. I'm sure over 32 years, somebody has asked you to to, re, to create, to justify, to put into action what you're actually doing throughout the year. What does that look like for you? Basically, I give them a, a handful of projects that I do. I, I kind of, in the years past, I, I like to do some computer science stuff too and some coding and stuff. Now, this year's class of seventh graders wants nothing to do with doing that. They want to do hands-on projects. So we're making a mess a lot, which is awesome because there's a time and a place for everything. Um, so creating some curriculum, I have a guideline of what I'm supposed to do. And to be honest with you, Jeff, my curriculum is based on really what they're doing in the core academics. So I want to know what the science teacher next door is doing. For example, if he's doing speed and velocity, I'm pulling out my matchbox cars and my makey makey boards and my Lego pieces, and we're going to make a timing gate that's going to start and stop and calculate the miles per hour of that little matchbox car going down the track. Mm. So they're going to, so they're using the skills. And that's, what's awesome about my classes. We're use we're the, we're the, you know, we're the class that says, how, why are we going to use this? When are we going to use this? Cause now we're going to use it. And it even I'll even take in some social studies stuff or some, some ELA stuff. Now math is obviously pretty easy. Uh, but I'll take in, in like we re- we read freak the mighty, the kids are reading freak the mighty book in ELA and there's some, some, um, uh, what are they called now? Um, articulated birds in the, in the, the guy makes some inventions. So we do some stuff like that when they're doing the story or we'll put together some Lego bricks and recreate a scene from the story and get creative with it and maybe do a stop motion video or a flip video or a podcast. Um, but some project around what they're doing in the core classes. I want to ask you a little bit about your budget because, you know, you're creating your class around the way that you're comfortable teaching. You like teaching, um, but clearly it sounds like there's some kind of a materials budget for this. How does all of that work for you? Uh, I'm again, I'm very lucky. I'm very spoiled in where I am with that. When that regard, in fact, my principal came to me the other day and said, Hey, you got X number of dollars to spend. You better spend it by, you know, next week. Uh, he didn't have to say that because we're going through construction right now. So a lot of that money could be encumbered and put back into the construction fees because we all know construction fees are going to go over mm-hmm. um, over budget. Uh, so I got some more cardboard and I got some more, um, excuse me, corrugated material. Don't call it cardboard because the packaging industry gets very upset with you. I, I learned that the hard way. And so we use we use that as a medium a lot and it's very inexpensive it's very easy to use um and again i i I use the recycled materials now additionally the state offered some grant money so i got a lot of of 
tools, like I got a laser cutter in my room, a small laser cutter in my room, which makes it great for rapid prototyping. I got some 3D printers in my room. Uh, this past year, I got a big vinyl sticker printer cutter thing uh, that I asked for so we can make some pretty awesome stuff. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I'm spoiled. <laughs> and and do you have a, a parent's group behind you or it's just, you know, like, hey, you're the sixth grade, you know, you're, you're, you're the sixth period teacher. This is what you do. Or do you have an entire community behind you trying to help and support you? we're lucky. I'm very lucky with my community. We got, we got great parental support and community support from things. And, and again, that's another part of project-based learning is you involve the community with it. Uh, you got to involve them. In, the, the businesses in your community want to give back. Um, so I'll bring in, uh, I taught an architecture class. Here's a great example. So I reached out to a local architect whose kids came through the school and he came in and talked to my kids for 80 minutes uh, my high school kids in an architecture class and those kids were on it for the entire 80 minutes and we he probably could have gone for another hour talking about the stuff that goes on at, at his job that's awesome so, that's, I mean, reach out to your community and, and invite those people and in. they want to share for more information of course you can check out coach thomastech.com. We're going to make sure that we have all the links over here. Now, Dan, one of the other things that you've been working on is helping other school districts bring in the love of Lego. Talk to us a little bit about some of the Lego workshops that you've been able to do outside of your district. Um, well, one of the, one of the things I am is also as a Lego certified trainer. So I get to travel around the country a little bit and, and teach teachers how to play with Lego. Um, but I'm also been I was actually Friday last Friday. Uh, I was at a workshop teaching teachers how to play with Lego and bring play into the classroom. And my and my way to do that is with Lego bricks. And what does a, a workshop with you look like? A mess. Uh, <laughs> lots of laughing. And and I actually brought this up the other day. These I I give them a build challenge. We talk about play and and the benefits of play from the Lego Foundation. Uh, they did a great study on it. Um, so we talked about how how it's holistic and it's got to be meaningful and there's got to be iterative, right? So we got to make make mistakes. And I give them a build challenge, like I do my kids uh, most days. So I give them three minutes and I said, "Hey, build me a something that defies gravity." All right. So I'll put the timer on the board and we go around and we're in their building, and then I'll ask them the question: When you were building for that three minutes, what was I doing? And they have no idea. I mm -hmm. could have left the room, walked down the hall, got a coffee. They would have had no clue because they were so engaged in the project. That sounds like a fantastic time. How many times do you get a chance to do that? And you say, go build something and they just look at you? Or do you set that up? I mean, do you have to bring an adult down to kid level? Or as soon as you put Lego in front of most adults, they're just going to have a good time. Nine times out of 10, if you put a Lego, a bowl of Lego or a plate of Lego out in front of somebody, they're going to start picking them up. Um, it's always nice to have them out on the table before they come in, but put, put some down in a faculty meeting next time. See what happens. Hmm. Uh, and, you... and one of the big things with Lego too and Lego Foundation is a lot of times our head gets in the way. Your hands know what you want to do, what they want to do. So sometimes you just got to just do something. Right. It's like the, it's like the the kid writing the English essay it doesn't know how to start it. But once you get rolling, you're going. Um, so you just got to get out of your own way sometimes. But but again, I, I want to go back to where do you get your materials from? I know you said sometimes they're secondhand. Are you just walking into Walmart with your credit card or do you go on to some Lego website and just buy a, a huge bag full of spare parts? Like, like, what does that look like for you to get ready for a workshop? I will, you know, I got a ton of Lego at my house and um, because it's just fun. And, and my son built some and, and they hit the floor and now they're in a bucket. So <laughs> we've all been there. So but I, 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 I go on to, uh, when I bought my bulk Lego, I went to Atlanta Brick Company, atlbrick.com. And I just, I could buy them by the pound. And it's just random stuff, um, anywhere between one to 10 pound increments. And uh, they were great. They shipped them to me. And, uh, you know, I just sometimes I'll put a Facebook post out there. Hey, I'm looking for, you know, matchbox cars or uh, anybody got any Lego that they want to donate. And, and you get some donations. Again, 
people have them, people want to share with the school. And sometimes they just buy some creative kits. What's your favorite um, boxed Lego kit that you might have bought from a store or from online? What, what's hanging on your wall that you're really proud of? I got the Concord. Really? I was looking at that today. That one's pretty awesome. I, I don't have any of the, you know, the big ones. I, I, I really, you know, my friend of mine's got the Titanic. I kind of, kind of want the Eiffel Tower. Um, there's some other cool ones coming out. So yeah, the tree house is pretty cool too. I, I, we were, we were talking about our, our mutual friend, uh, Dr. Matt Joseph earlier today. I don't think Matt knows this or not, but Matt is actually helping me to build my largest Lego set. Um, when I started to write the book, I made a, 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 a deal with myself that says I will do one bag for every chapter written. And now that I've officially turned in the book to him, I can officially finish building the grand piano. And so I've been having fun with that now for the last three years, because that's how long it has taken me to put this thing to rest. And now that I've officially turned it into him, um, I am looking forward to finally putting the top and the bench in front of the piano. It's sitting behind me over here, but uh, that's, that's one of my biggest ones. But I'm also looking at, I, I bought all three uh, mosaics to build the huge Darth Vader to put on the wall. Nice. So, lots of Lego in my room. Of course, you know, doing play with, with the triplets. That's, that's what it's all about here. So uh, atlbrick.com. I'm checking it out. I'll certainly make sure that I have the link to this. If anybody's out there and look, if you guys have any good Lego stories or anything that you guys are doing out there with, with project-based learning, let us know. You can always reach out to us over at teachercast.net slash contact. Would love to have you. And would love to have you guys be on the show as well to share what you guys are doing in your classrooms. Dan, one last time, where can we learn more about that great podcast of yours? Uh, I'm on Spotify podcast and it's the Tech Ed Clubhouse. Uh, it's available there. It's available on Google. Well, not Google podcast because they close now, but uh, it's on Amazon. And you can head over to CoachThomasTech.com. It's, it's right there. Well, of course, I have all of those links on our show notes. And I want to say thank you so much for Dan. Dan, thank you for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. It was my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you very much. And that wraps up this episode of Digital Learning today. On behalf of Dan and everybody here in TeacherCast, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network, hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.